reading. Film slash genre by Rick Altman. Chapter one. What's at stake in the history of lit of literary genre theory? Chapter one. What's at stake in the history of literary genre theory? Question mark. We discover that the critical theory of genres is stuck precisely where Aristotle left it. The very word, quote, genre, end quote, sticks out in an English sentence as the unpronounceable and alien thing it is. Most critical efforts to handle such generic terms as, quote, epic, end quote, and, quote, novel, end quote, are chiefly interesting as examples of the psychology of rumor. Northrop Fry, Anatomy of Criticism, 1957, page 13. Of all the concepts fundamental to literary theory, none has a longer and more distinguished lineage than the question of literary types or genres. From Aristotle to Todorov and from Horace to Wellick and Warren, the topic of genre has remained one of the staples of theoretical discourse. As much as has been written on genre, however, the historical study of genre theory can hardly be characterized as a satisfying enterprise. The debate over genre has consistently taken place in slow motion. The decades or even centuries that have separated major genre theory statements have all too often led the debaters alternately to take disputed propositions for granted or to forget the very topic of the debate. The history of genre theory thus traces a particularly zigzag trajectory, sharing major claims with their predecessors. Theoreticians on the straight stretches events no need to justify their positions, while genre theorists in the turns rarely explain why a change of direction is necessary. Yet, quietly, the genre theories of the past have nevertheless set certain standards that continue tacitly to underlie recent attempts to theorize genre. If this chapter contains many of the familiar names of generic thinking, it is not, however, simply to rehearse what these thinkers have said about genre. In other words, what follows is, in no sense, a history of literary genre theory. Rather, in the hope of discovering the origins of our own blindness, the purpose here is to highlight the very claims that genre theorists have failed to recognize they were making. The constitutive assumptions that theoreticians have neglected to acknowledge in their own work the habits and positions that have been silently passed on, often at cross purposes with official positions and conscious claims. Classical genre theory. Quote, I propose to treat of poetry in itself and of its various kinds, noting the essential quality of each. End quote, says Aristotle at the outset of Poetics. Epic poetry and tragedy, comedy also, and dithyrambic poetry and the music of the flute and of the lyre in most of their forms are all in their general conception modes of imitation. They differ, however, from one another in three respects, the medium, the objects, 
the manner or mode of imitation being in each case distinct. Certainly, one of the most attractive features of Aristotle's famous treatise and one of the sources of its continued influence is the clarity, indeed the apparently incontrovertible simplicity with which e every claim is made. Everything is straightforward, or rather, as with all great rhetoricians, every claim is made to seem straightforward. In fact, every one of Aristotle's apparently transparent expressions conceals a set of assumptions tacitly adopted by virtually every subsequent genre theorist. An expanded version of the first sentence of the poetics should help to underscore the assumptions that Aristotle asked us to make with him. Block quote, I propose to treat of the form of activity that our society has labeled poetry, which I claim can best be considered as an isolated phenomenon in itself and of what I will treat as its various kinds, noting or rather claiming that there is such a thing as the essential quality of each. End of block quote. In order to begin his work, Aristotle must define an object of study. By borrowing an already defined object rather than defining his own, however, Aristotle provides a model for centuries of genre thinkers. Surprisingly, this most careful of thinkers thus opens his thought to whatever Greeks the Trojan horse of, quote, poetry, end quote, might carry. Who defined poetry, question mark, to what end, question mark, on the basis of what assumptions, question mark, with what ramifications for the proposed generic breakdown, question mark. Aristotle's spare declarative style makes it unlikely that these questions will be asked and very likely that subsequent theoreticians will remain oblivious to the slippery slope of the underlying terrain on which their theories are built. The very notions that poetry exists, quote, in itself, end quote, and that a kind or that a kind can have an, quote, essential quality, end quote, involve unsubstantiated claims with far-reaching effects. These unopposed assumptions justify Aristotle's famous claim that the types of poetry differ in medium, object, and manner of imitation, along with the implication that no other differences are involved. Note that the author of the Nicomachean Ethics does not suggest that the types of poetry differ in the uses to which they are put, the places in which they are used, or the groups that use them. He does not propose distinctions based on the actions that differing types of poetry inspire, but instead assumes that poems with similar, quote, essential, end quote, qualities will produce similar effects on their audiences. Thus, all poems that arouse pity and fear are not necessarily tragedies, but all tragedies may be expected to arouse pity and fear. My purpose here is not to show that Aristotle is in any way wrong, but rather to show that A, the poetics is based on unspoken and apparently incontrovertible assumptions, B, these assumptions sanction certain types of conclusion while precluding others, and C, alternatives do exist to the positions taken by Aristotle. 
For example, given the origin of Greek poetic forms in diverse rituals, a categorization of poems based on their differing rituals uses or yeah, uses would or what ritual uses would have produced a fascinating and fully defensible generic breakdown. From within the poetics, however, such an approach remains invisible, unthinkable, not only to today's readers, but more importantly to readers across the ages who have taken their generic cues from Aristotle. As influential as it may have been, Aristotle's categorization of the kinds of poetry has had the effect of narrowing genre theory ever since by accentuating poetry's internal characteristics rather than the kinds of experience fostered by poetry. Aristotle set genre theory on to a to a virtually unbroken course of textual analysis not that textual concerns and experiential experiential concerns are entirely unrelated but their relationship requires theorization and that is precisely what aristotle's spare style and unanswerable rhetoric preclude by the time Horace drafted his Ars Poetica, three centuries after Aristotle's death, the Greek philosopher's arguments about poetic types had achieved the status of received truth. Whereas Aristotle opens his poetics with the stealth of a rhetorician schooled in the delicate art of platonic debate, Horace begins his epistle on the art of poetry with the bravado of an author sanctioned by the ancients block quote suppose a painter meant to attach a horse's neck to the head of a man and to put fancy work of many colored feathers on limbs of creatures picked at random the kind of thing where the torso of a sharply maiden or of a shapely maiden merges merges into the dark rear half of a fish would you smother your amusement my friends if you were let in to see the result question mark believe me Pisson's a book will be very much like that painting if the meaningless images are put together like the dreams of a man in a fever to the end that the head and the foot do not match the one body end of block quote wrapped in the authority of his culture's notion of nature Horace need not argue for the existence of genres. The only natural and healthy thing to do, Horace implies, is to recognize the differences among genres. If nature and health exist, then so do genres. Confident as if backed up by the combined Roman legions, Horace leaves the recipient of his epistle little room to maneuver. Each genre must be understood as a separate entity with its own literary rules and prescribed procedures. Tragic verse forms, Horace affirms, must not be used for comic situations. Quote, let each form of poetry occupy the proper place allotted to it, end quote, inaugurating a long tradition whereby genre and decorum are allied in critical discourse with proper behavior expected of literature and citizens alike. Horace also initiates the equally tenacious tradition according to which the authority behind the quote proper end quote and the method of allotting a separate place to 
each form of poetry remain outside the genre theorist range of analysis. Quoted continually from the late Renaissance to the 18th century in support of neoclassical poetic and theatrical practices, Horace's Ars Poetica contains more than detailed prescriptions regarding specific genres. More important are two changes in emphasis with relation to the Aristotelian model. For Aristotle, imitation means mimesis, sketching from nature. For Horace, the same term implies imitation of a literary model and adherence to the standards represented by that model. As described by distinguished critics, such as Horace himself. In, in other words, the notion of genre is now fully conscripted into the legion of techniques whereby writers are trained to respect current standards of cultural acceptability. With this redefinition of generic imitation as a major form of cultural indoctrination, a fundamental bifurcation occurs in generic thinking. Whereas Aristotle aims primarily at description of existing works of art, sometimes speaking solely as critic, sometimes addressing the problems of, po the problems of poets and their audiences, Horace is mainly concerned to prescribe appropriate modes of writing poetry. Having devoted the first half of the poetics to a historical and theoretical analysis of poetic genres, only in the latter half of the treatise does Aristotle begin to... Uh, I'll read it back. Having devoted the first half of the poetics to a historical and theoretical analysis of poetic genres, only in the latter half of the treatise does Aristotle begin to sketch out appropriate writing practices. To the Greek masters, historical pre-preterites, pre preter, preterites and descriptive present or present tenses correspond Horace's incessant imperatives. Let the work of art be whatever you want as long as it is simple and has unity. 90, page 96. Adopt material to match your talents. Page 96. Let each form of poetry occupy the proper place allotted to it. Page 97. Do not bring out on stage actions that should properly take place inside and remove from view the many events which the descriptive powers of an actor present on the stage will soon relate. Do not have Medea butcher her sons before the audience. Page 100. Do not let a play consist of less than five acts. Do not have a good and or do not have a god intervene. Have the chorus carry the part of an actor and do not let them sing anything between the acts which does not contribute to the plot and fit properly into it. Page 100. Whatever you have in the way of a lesson, make it short. Page 103. At every turn, Horace is concerned to provide clear rules for generically faithful literary composition. To Aristotle's concern for the structure of generic text is now added a durable interest in the production of generic text. Curiously, for all his emphasis on the production of poetry, Horace radically disassociates the processes of creation and criticism. The critic does the reading of 
previous poetry and criticism while the writer carries out the critic's prescriptions. As we, as we will see in later chapters, this split has a significant effect on the future of genre theory. Whereas Aristotle saw history in theory, criticism and practice, audience and poets as somehow all intertwined, Horace sets up a simple generic model for the ages, poets produced by imitating a predefined original sanctioned by the literary critical oligarchy. Neoclassical genre theory. As filtered through Horace and the power of Roman literary institutions, Aristotelian notions of genre provided the very foundation of the neoclassical critical system. Rediscovered by Italian Renaissance authors, Aristotle inspired virtually nonstop publications of poetic treatise, treatises throughout the 16th century. In three volumes, Marco Girolamo Vita, one or fifteen twenty seven in six Eugento Antonio Minterno fifteen fifty nine in seven Julius Caesar Scaliger fifteen sixty one or in a single volume summary Ludovico Castelvetro fifteen seventy for nearly two centuries, the adaptation of Neo-Aristolian principles would be chronicled and justified in the writings of such important writer critics as Torquato Tasso, Torquato Tasso, Pierre Cornille, Nicholas Boileau, John Dryden, and Alexander Pope. Perhaps the most celebrated cause of this period is the battle over the ultimate generic crossbreed. Tragedy comedy. Ever the in incontrovertible naturalist, Horace had set limits on the poet's right to mix genres. Quote, it does not go to the extent that Savage should mate with tame that serpents should couple with birds or lambs lambs with tigers end quote reacting strongly against the medieval grotesque tendency to mix the sublime in the in the ridiculous the sacred in the secular the tragic in the comic 17th century french neoclassical critics at first found it quite impossible to accept the new composite. Yet little by little the production of new plays by Pierre Cornel and Jean Mayret in the second quarter of the 17th century along with the apparent Roman precedent of Plutus Plutus's Amphitrite M by Tryon, Amphitryon broke down critical resistance and led to acceptance of the hybrid genre. For our purposes, one particular lesson stands out from this unexpected development that a new genre should be born in an expanding culture hardly provides cause for surprise. More important is the way in which this genre develops out of the coupling of two genres previously thought diametrically opposed. In spite of the Horatian commitment to keep genres separate and the Neo-Aristolian refusal to recognize genres not mentioned by Aristotle, the rise of tragic comedy demonstrates the possibility of generating new genres through the monstrous mating of already existing genres. For the first time, genre theory must accommodate itself to genre history rather than vice versa. 
During the latter half of the 18th century, a new genre began to edge its way between tragedy and comedy. At first called simply the, quote, serious genre, end quote, as opposed to the classical genres deemed incapable of dealing with contemporary reality, the new genre was denigrated as the, quote, weepy genre, end quote, genre L'Armoriant by its conservative opponents, eventually baptized simply, quote, John drama, in quote, drum, by its radical supporters, Dennis Derriot, Pierre, Pierre de Beaumachais, Louis Sebastian Mercier. This is the theatrical form that would eventually give rise to melodrama, the most popular theatrical mode of the 19th century and cinema's most important parent genre. The details surrounding the new genre's rise to popularity and its post-revolutionary transformation into popular melodrama are less important here than genre's new role as the object of critical and political strife. If Aristotle has remained a favorite with 20th century genre theoreticians, it is in part because his primary purpose was to describe and codify existing practice rather than to exercise any direct influence over that practice. While most recent genre critics and theorists continue to accept genres, including melodrama, as classically attested pre-existent forms, the history of melodrama reveals that critics once understood their role as far more active and intervenous or interventionist interventionist the example of melodrama stresses the critics potential role in making genre a living changing active parts of cultural development and self-expression. From this point on in the history of genre theory, classically motivated genre separation will never again hold sway. Yet, as we shall see, many of the hidden institutional commitments underlying the classical system will never fully die. 19th century genre theory. As with the classics, so with the romantics, but in reverse. Whereas the neoclassical approach to all composition began with identification and separation of genres, romantic inspiration was based on the breaking down of all generic differences. German theoretician Frederick Slagle provided the philosophical underpinnings recommending abolition of all generic classifications in this dialogue on poetry, 1800, while two French renegades led the assault. Stendhal spearheaded the first attacks in his tract, Racine et Shakespeare, 1823 and 18. 25 with Victor Hugo's theatrical works and their prefaces soon providing able reinforcement. Cornwell in 1827, Hernani in 1830. In support of its genre mixing aesthetic, the Romantic movement rapidly established a new canon, including such unlikely bedfellows as Isaiah, Aeschylus, or Aeschylus, Rabelais, and Shakespeare, all masters of the mixed genre. 
Here again, we encounter an unexpected contribution to the broader realm of genre theory. The neoclassical canon was fully furnished by centuries of tradition. The only remaining questions were of the order of whether Homer or Virgil was the greater epic poet. The Romantics quickly discovered that new genre theories can be skillfully buttressed by adducing a carefully concocted new canon, choosing works from different countries and even different periods. Hugo throws in Homer, St. Paul, Tacitus, Dante, and Cervantes for good measure. The Romantics fully revealed for the first time just how effectively genre theory and even the production of generically marked literary works can be pressed into the service of broader institutional goals. Often forgotten, this lesson will be recalled in later sections of this book. The final decades of the 19th century witnessed a development of particular importance for the future of genre theory. While the binomial nomenclature system of Carolus Linnaeus had provided a new basis for the classification system used in the world's increasingly numerous natural history museums, it took the evolutionary schemes of Charles Darwin and Herbert Spencer to attract the literary community to a scientific model, especially in the work of French literary historian Ferdinand Brunetaire. The evolutionary model was directly applied to the problem of genres, particularly in the multi-volume L'Evolution des Genres, 1890 through 94. Believing in the reality of genres as if they were biological species, Brontier was, of course, only providing scientific underpinnings for the already familiar Horatian model. The strength of this added argument, however, can scarcely be overestimated. Reinvented by virtually every student of the genre since Brontier, or Brontier, scientific justification of genre study serves to convince theorists that genres actually exist, that they have distinct broad or distinct borders that they can be firmly identified that they operate systematically that their internal functioning can be observed and scientifically described and that they evolve according to a fixed and identifiable trajectory it is indeed surprising just how far the influence of this attitude extends. Within a page of the beginning of the fantastic 1970, for example, as careful a scholar as Vetin Todorov quotes Karl Popper's claim that, quote, no matter how many instances of white swans we have observed, this does not justify the conclusion that all swans are white, in quote, page four. Anxious to establish the validity of a deductive scientific method, Todorov retorts, block quote, on the other hand, A hypothesis which is based on the observation of a limited number of swans, but which also informs us that their whiteness is the consequence of an organic characteristic would be perfectly legitimate. To return from swans to novels, 
This general scientific truth applies not only to the study of genres, but also to that of a writer's entire over or to that of a of a specific period, etc. 1970 page four end of block quote. Given the well-known genre of swans, claims Todorov, I can take a small number of specific swans at random, study their organic makeup, and come to legitimate conclusions regarding the entire genre. But who will define the genre of swans? We might well object when, quote, swan, end quote, stands for, quote, fantastic novel, End quote question mark and how will we know how to recognize a quote swan end quote when we see one question mark and just what are the organic characteristics of quote swans end quote question mark and so on the scientific model offers an extraordinarily powerful rhetorical ploy yet begging basic questions it often leads unsuspecting readers astray perhaps more important still by obscuring very real theoretical problems the scientific model all too often keeps serious genre theorists from coming to terms with all aspects of their own object of study 20th century genre not surprising, 20th century genre theory begins with a resounding, quote, no, exclamation point, end quote, to the scientific schemes of Bruntier and his many imitators. From his very important publication in 1902, Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic, Italian theorist and critic Benedetto Cruz launched a frontal attack on the very concept of genre. Indeed, by his own admission, the critique of genres provided the impetus for Cruz's entire philosophy, noting that attempts to prescribe the code of a genre are consistently defeated by poets' efforts to exceed or subvert that code. Cruz sought to sweep away virtually all gener generalizing critical discourse. Ironically, where he might have become the father of postmodernism with its distaste for totalizing discourse, Cruz instead sired an unexpected combination of nihilism and aestheticism along with a fundamental shift in the definition of genre pro problematics. For over a century before Cruz, virtually all genre theory involved some version of the classic versus romantic genre dialectic, opposing the so-called pure genres handed down by tradition to modern mixed genres more attentive to human multiplicity and complex reality. Cruz's strong critique, critique of genres had the effect of shifting genre theory towards a new dialectic op opposing generic categories and individual text, whereas all literary composition as well as all interpretive acts had for centuries been seen as occurring within generic boundaries, the new model figured genre as one pole of an, of an opposition featuring modernist innovators at the other pole, eventually played out by Anglo-American new criticism. This new dialectic also had an important influence on post-war film theory, which neatly opposed bedrock genres to the creative efforts of auteurs capable of subverting and personalizing them. 
one of the most influential and level-headed attempts to renew genre theory in the post cruise era came from Renee Wellick and Austin Warren in their Theory of Literature, 1956, written during written during the 1940s while both were faculty members at the University of Iowa, distinguishing between what they call, quote, inner, end quote, and, quote, outer, end quote, form. Wellick and Warren proposed a bifurcated approach, quote, genre should or block quote genre should be conceived we think as a grouping of literary works based theoretically upon both outer form specific matter and structure and also upon inner form attitude tone purpose more crudely subject and audience the ostensible basis may be one or the other, e.g., quote, pastoral, end quote, and, quote, satire, end quote, for the inner form, dipotic verse and pindaric ode for the outer, or for outer. But the critical problem will then be to find the other dimension to complete the diagram. Wellick and Warren, 1956, page 231, end of block quote. Encouraging critics to investigate the relationship between structure and technique, Wellick and Warren clearly provided both a conscious model for analysis and criteria according to which the existence and extent of a genre may be conveniently judged. In providing such a reasonable model, however, they reveal a strange blindness. On the one hand, they recognize that genres are more than just convenient classification aids. Quote, the literary kind is an, quote, institution, end quote, as church, university, or state is an institution. It exists not as an animal exists or even as a building, chapel, library, or capital, but as an institution exists, end quote. Page 226. Thus, distancing themselves from Brontier and the biological model, Wellick and Warren open up a potentially new domain for genre theory, providing critics with the wherewithal not just to recognize genres, but to, re- but to redraw the generic map based on con- concordances of inner and outer form. Wellick and Warren nevertheless fail to recognize the role of the theorist or critic in founding generic institutions, thus missing the opportunity to bring radical change to genre theory. The possibility of redrawing generic charts only vaguely evoked by Wellick and Warren was rapidly realized in the work of Canadian scholar Northrop Fry whose Anatomy of Criticism, 1957, remained at the center of international genre theory debate for two decades. Taking his cue from Young, Fry links literary forms with broader archetypal categories, especially in his, quote, theory of mythos, end quote, Fry single-mindedly follows up his institutions and observations regarding inner and outer literary form to the point of redescribing and thus ultimately redefining such familiar generic categories as comedy, romance, and tragedy. No longer would the establishment of a corpus of text depend on tradition alone. 
adducing a wide spectrum of sometimes unexpected texts in support of his revised definitions, Fry treats literary criticism and its categories not as institutions, but as the object of a new scientific endeavor based on a broad inductive approach and the positing of coherence. How ironic that Fry, as the first theorist perhaps of all time single-handedly to succeed in imposing a new generic classification, should fail to recognize the institutional nature and ramifications of his own activities, which he instead defines as transparently and selfishly scientific. While Brentier borrowed the evolutionary content of Darwin's Origin of Species, 1859, Fry adopts its revolutionary method and its idealistic vision of a political scientific endeavor. With the Scopes trial, Darwinians learnt once and for all that new scientific paradigms, however rational, would always be seen by certain sectors of society as unacceptable competition. If literary questions could cause the, quote, battles, end quote, associated with Cornel's Lacid in 1636 through 1637 and Hugo's Hernani in, in 1830, it hardly seems surprising that a problem of, quote, pure, end quote, literary theory should lead to academic strife in the 1960s. Appearing in French in 1970, the first chapter of Tvetzin or Vetstin Todorov's The Fantastic was in a sense Fry's Scopes trial. He doesn't lose the trial in spite of strong criticism leveled at him by Todorov, but at a time when North American and European literary theories were clearly locked in battle over the terrain of young academic minds, including my own at the time, Fry's trial by critic or trial by critique. Fry Fry's trial by critique certainly sent out a clear signal to all would-be followers of Fry. Quote: In spite of what you may have heard e.g. from Jeffrey Hartman's article in the 1966 Yale French Studies issue on structuralism, anatomy of criticism is not consonant with French structuralism, end quote. Todorov, or Todorov begins by expressing six articles of faith that he shares with Fry and that have been adopted by most subsequent genre theorists. One, literary studies must be conducted in a scientific manner. Two, value judgments have no place in literary studies. Three, literature is systematic. Chance has no part in it. Four, literary analysis should be synchronic as if all texts existed simultaneously. Five, literary discourse is not referential. Six, literature is created from literature, not from reality. 1970, pages nine through 10. Such a set of assumptions might well have led Todorov to welcome Fry into the structuralist camp. Instead, Todorov castigates Fry for a series of failings, including the inability to recognize the difference between, quote, theoretical, end quote, genres, which are deduced from a theory of literature, and, quote, historical, end quote, genres, which are the result of an observation of literary phenomena. Seeking to disassociate himself from previous unsystematic genre study and 
to stake out a firm ground on which on which a durable analysis might be built. Todorov distinguishes between the types traditionally recognized by our culture, epic, short story, lyric poetry, and so forth, and the new types suggested by the modern systematic, cri- systematic critic. Types accepted by the culture are thus labeled, quote, historical, end quote, while, quote, theoretical, end quote, types are defined by the critic. But this opposition begs the question of the critic's position within the culture. All historical genres or types were once theoretical genres defined by the critics of a former culture who may have been known by other names, essayist, journalist, or simply men or women of taste and influence. But who, but who played the role of critic nonetheless? According to a theory then current, not a self-consciously elaborated theory like that championed by Todorov, but the theory, but a theory nonetheless. In spite of the repeated pronouncements of Todorov and others, there is no place outside of history from which purely, quote, theoretical, end quote, definitions of genre might be made. In substituting his so-called, quote, theoretical, end quote, definition of the fantastic for a series of historical categories, fairy tale, ghost story, gothic novel, etc., Todorov is only substituting a current historical understanding of literature heavily dependent on contemporary fashions of psychoanalysis and formal analysis. For a former historical definition of literature, referring instead to literature's mimetic function and thus dependent on content paradigms, reading the fantastic a generation after its publication, we already recognize its vocabulary its methodological tools, and its classification of literature as marked by a particular period which only recently was the present, which may once have appeared not yet historical, but which we now identify with the historical phenomenon of French structuralism. The, quote, fantastic, end quote, as defined by Todorov is already, was always already, a historical genre. Quote, theoretical, end quote, when it is opposed to, quote, historical, end quote, defines a utopian space, a, quote, no place, end quote, from which critics may seemingly justify blindness to their own historicity. Just as the critic is always part of a culture, thus undermining any attempt to oppose the critical to the cultural, so the theoretician always stands on the historical marked ground of a particular era. Whether or not Todorov's justification of theoretical genres makes historical sense, The fantastic certainly furthers the tendency already posited by Wellick and Warren and developed by Fry towards critic-defined genres. Indeed, Todorov goes so far as to place the primary determinant of the fantastic genre within the reader. Does the reader hesitate between two explanations, one uncanny, the other marvelous, of the phenomenon encountered in the text? Question mark. Then the text must be considered part of the fantastic genre. While this approach perhaps raises more problems than it solves, can the same text be fantastic for 
one reader but not fantastic for another question mark can the same text be fantastic on first reading but not on subsequent readings question mark does the genre exist among the impressionable and on dark nights but not among scientists or in the daytime question mark it is or it paradoxically throws Todorov's readers trained to respect self-conscious theory over all else back on the mercy of untutored readers capable of making decisions of generic multitudes simply by deferring reading past nightfall. This dependence on readers' attitudes exactly reverses the, the order of priorities that we noted earlier in Aristotle's logic. For the Greek philosopher, tragedies are defined by their essential properties and because they share essential properties they can be expected to have similar effects on viewers i.e arousing pity and fear how different the history of genre theory might have been had aristotle taken the opposite position identifying all texts that arouse pity and fear as tragedy rather than vice versa Indeed, this is precisely what Todorov, Todorov does. Rather than claim that all fantastic texts cause readers to hesitate between two readings, he suggests that all texts producing hesitation between uncanny and marvelous readings are part of the fantastic genre. The fantastic thus stands as a potentially important turning point in literary genre theory not because it out outstructures and out theorizes Fry's anatomy of criticism in the front room but because it opens the back door to ordinary historical readers and their reading habits in many ways Todorov's project thus parallels that of E.D. Hirsch Jr., whose validity in interpretation, 1967, reintroduced the notion of genre into the reading process, not only for generic readings or interpretation of specific literary genres, but for every act of reading, literary or not. Hirsch's project develops the simple and apparently unexceptional, unexceptionable insight that, quote, the details of the meaning or the details of meaning that an interpreter understands are powerfully determined and constituted by his meaning expectations and these expectations arise from the interpreter's conception of the type of meaning that is being expressed in quote 1967 page 72. this basic tenet of schema theory is proved early or is proved every day when we manage to understand dialogue that we can hardly hear simply because we have a clear idea of the general type of meaning involved from time to time, of course, we confirm Hirsch's hypothesis more negatively by misconstruing a message that we heard perfectly well, simply because we had wrongly identified the type of meaning involved. From this broad assumption, Hirsch moves directly to the claim that, quote, an interpreter's preliminary generic conception of a text is constitutive of everything that he subsequently understands and that this remains the case unless and until that generic conception is altered in quote page 74 sliding all too easily from quote type of meaning in quote to quote genre in quote Hirsch is able to affirm that, quote, every disagreement about an interpretation is usually a disagreement about genre, end quote, page 98. By equating, quote, genre, end quote, with, quote, type of meaning, end quote, however, 
Hirsch has broadened the notion of genre to the point where it no longer coincides with the meaning usually ascribed to the term in literary theory. Certainly, Hirsch is right. Certainly, Hirsch is right to claim that a husband's comment on returning home late, quote, I'm very tired tonight, may, end quote, may carry a variety of meanings, depending on the conventions that have been established between husband and wife, page 53. Yet the word genre will have changed meanings too much to be of any use to us if it must refer to general types of meaning like, quote, expression of physical state, end quote, quote, admission regarding previous whereabouts, end quote, or, quote, refusal to participate in lovemaking activities, end quote. While Hirsch offers eloquent evidence for the role of genres in the meaning-making process, he unintentionally spotlights the extent to which literary and filmic genres are more than just general classes of text expressing determinable types of meaning. More than previous genre theorists, Todorov and Hirsch tie questions of text textual structure to reader expectations regarding textual structure. Within their methodology, this strategy serves as yet one more way to focus attention on a text's formal properties. If it were released for general usage, however, this emphasis on reading patterns would risk provoking what we might call a, quote, sorcerer's apprentice, end quote, effect. Once the magic word, quote, reader, end quote, is pronounced, there might be no controlling the ultimate effect. Once labeled by writers and critics, genres might well fall into the hands of untutored readers or out of control audiences. Thus far, this threat has not materialized. On the contrary, the most important English language genre theory of the last two decades, Alastair Fowler's Kinds of Literature, an introduction to the theory of genres and modes, 1982, resolutely returns to classical emphasis on textual structure within traditional genres and canons of text instead of releasing responsive responsibility for genres to readers and audiences. Quote, the kinds, however, elusive objectively exist. End quote. Quote, the kinds, however, elusive objectively exist. End quote. Says Fowler, page 73, permanently closing off debate. Ten Tendencies of Literary Genre Theory At the conclusion of even as cursory an overview as that presented here, it should be possible to outline the major principles of genre theory established by two millennia of genre theorists. Yet, this is precisely what we cannot do. Even so simple a question as the meaning and extent of the term genre remains confusing, for the term inconsistently refers to distinctions derived from a wide variety of differences among text. Type of presentation, epic slash lyric slash dramatic, relation to reality, fiction versus nonfiction, historical kind, comedy slash tragedy slash tragedy comedy, level of style, novel versus romance, or content paradigm, sentimental novel slash historical novel slash adventure novel. 
While this overview of literary genre theory has been far too limited to provide anything like a history of the topic, it has served to bring to the surface a number of important tendencies, questions, and contradictions that deserve to be recalled as we move to the area of film genre. The following list thus attends to unexpressed assumptions shared by genre theorists, along with some of the theoretical problems that remain unaddressed over the long history of genre-oriented literary speculation. One, it is generally taken for granted that genres actually exist, that they have distinct borders, and that they can be firmly identified. Indeed, these facts have seemed so obvious to theoreticians that they have rarely seemed worthy of discussion, let alone questioning. Two, because genres are taken to be, quote, out there, end quote, existing independently of observers, genre theorists have generally sought to describe and define what they believe to be already existing genres rather than create their own interpretive categories, however applicable or useful. Three, most genre theory has attended either to the process of creating generic text in imitation of a sanctioned predefined original or to internal structures attributed to those texts, in part because the internal functioning of genre text is considered entirely observable and objectively describable. Four, genre theorists have typically assumed that texts with similar characteristics systematically generate similar readings, similar meanings, and similar uses. Five, in the language of theoreticians, proper genre production is regularly allied with decorum, nature, science, and other standards produced and defended by the sponsoring society. Few genre theorists have shown interest in analyzing this relationship. Six. It is regularly assumed that producers, readers, and critics all share the same interest in genre and that genres serve those interests equally. Seven, reader expectation and audience reaction have thus received little independent attention. The uses of generic text have also largely been neglected. Genre history, or eight, Genre history holds a shifting and uncertain place in relation to genre theory, most often simply disregarded by its synchronically oriented partner. Genre history nevertheless cries out for increased attention by virtue of its ability to scramble generic codes, to blur established generic tableau, and to muddy accepted generic ideas. At times, genre history has been used creatively in support of specific institutional goals. For example, by creating a new canon of works supportive of a revised genre theory. Nine, most genre theorists prefer to style themselves as somewhat radically separate from the objects of their study, thus justifying their use of meliorative terms like, quote, objective, end quote, quote, scientific, end quote, or, quote, theoretical, end quote, to describe their activity, yet the application of scientific assumptions to generic assumptions to generic questions usually obscures as many problems as it solves.
10. Genre theoreticians and other practitioners are generally loath to recognize and build into their theories the institutional character of their own generic practice. Though regularly touting, quote, proper, end quote, approaches to genre, theorists rarely analyze the cultural stakes involved in identifying certain approaches as, quote, improper, end quote. Yet genres are never entirely neutral categories. They and their critics and theorists always participate in and further the work of various institutions. Regarding a number of important interrelated questions, literary genre theory has come to no firm conclusion. For some, the important dialectic constitutive of genre theory and practice involves the opposition of pure genres to mixed genres, while others stress the antithesis between genres and individual text. Some theorists pay attention to the contrast between rule-driven production and spontaneous creation, while other theoreticians are more interested in the difference between inner and outer form. Does genre reside in a pre-existing does genre reside in a pre-existing pattern? in text, in criticism, or somewhere else, question mark. Are genres classificatory conveniences or are they representations of reality, question mark. What difference do genres make, question mark. How and to whom do they make that difference, question mark. Even the term, quote, genre, end quote, is itself extremely volatile in extent as well as in object and content. But it cannot be taken for granted that film genre is the same thing as literary genre, nor should we assume that film genre theory is coterminous with literary genre theory, even if it does it does largely derive from the work of literary theorists. In the next chapter, we will discover whether any of these questions receives more satisfactory treatment in the work of film genre theorists. And I was reading chapter one, what's at stake in the history of literary genre theory Chapter one, what's at stake in the history of literary genre theory, question mark, in film slash genre by Rick Altman.